The production and presentation of this program is made possible in part by a grant from the Ohio Arts Council. This friend was uh, hoboing through town and he stopped in Toledo. And uh, he stopped in one of the after hour joints and he was in there playing and they was buying him drinks and everything. And he said some guy walked up to him and tapped him on the shoulder and said, listen, he said, I have a blind fella in here. Would you mind him playing? And the guy thought, blind? He says, no. He says, I, I don't mind him playing. So finally he got the seat and sat down. And he said the first thing he did, he started at the bottom end of the piano and just sailed up through it like this and picked up at the right hand and went on to the other end of the piano. <laughs> and then he reached his handkerchief and got his, got his handkerchief out and, and he wiped his head like he's really getting ready to play something. So this guy said he looked at that. <laughs> he said, my God, he said he backed on away from there and he eased on out of there. And said when he got started playing, he said, Jack, he said, listen, <laughs> I know that wasn't no place for me. He said he come on out of there and went on out of there and called the train to come on back home. And he told me, Mr. Jack, I'm telling you the truth. He said, listen, if you ever in life here, you'll know it. He was a man who sent more than one piano player packing for home. In an encyclopedia of jazz musicians' musicians poll, 68 out of 100 voted for him. Yet the name Art Tatum is less well known than the names of the men who admired him, even in his hometown, Toledo. Horseless carriages were beginning to appear, but bicycles and wagons were the main transportation at the turn of the century, the time when Arthur Tatum Sr. moved from the Carolinas to settle in Toledo. An asterisk was placed next to his name in the city directory. It signified that he was black. On October 13, 1910, Art Jr. was born. Mildred Tatum encouraged her children to play, but Art's perfect ear was not always appreciated by his sister, Arlene. My mother, she uh, would tell me, all right, it's time to practice, come on in. So I would forget that Art was upstairs in the bed, you know. So wanting to go out and play, you know, I'd come in and practice a little bit, you know, and I'd run through it right quick. and. Mom, she would say, okay, now take the next one. And I'd take the next one, and Art would howl down and say, she's not through with the first one yet. He'd be upstairs in the bed, probably sleep, but I mean, he just thought of music that well, you know. Flower Hospital represented a landmark to young Art Tatum. Blind since infancy, a series of operations there gave him partial vision in one eye. So anyway, Dr. Lesman got him to see him in one eye. And he used to go and play pool, and he liked to play cards, and he'd hold the cards up real close, you know. And uh, he could see sometimes some of the boys would buy uh, cards with large numbers on them and things, you know, for him, you know, because they liked to play with him, and he loved to play cards. Art uh, probably had uh, partial vision downward. And when he would walk down the street or be on a basketball floor, he would always elevate his head so he as far back as he could, so he, whatever vision he had, it came from that direction. And he would attempt to play basketball, and like to shoot marbles, and he would even try throwing a ball to you, things like that. And walking down the street, I never saw him with a cane. He'd take long steps, reaching out as if he was anticipating encountering something, he could check himself. They played um, marbles, shooters, they call them shooters, and uh, they played over in the alley over there. There was a little area over there where they played at, and they played football and uh, baseball. And Art, he'd be right, he loved football. He'd be right in them with the football. He was accepted as any other fellow in the crowd. He did everything that the rest of them did, or at least he tried, and no one ever accused him of being backward. Though he loved sports, music continued to be his main interest. The musical activities at the Frederick Douglass Center were an early influence. Still legally blind, Tatum attended special classes of the Toledo Public Schools, where he took piano lessons from Overton Ramey. Several years later, Bill Kumaro became one of Ramey's pupils. I was taking a piano lesson, and I happened to be beating my foot. And he, he said, boy, you don't beat your foot. 
He said, you've got to count. One, two, three, four, and he was kind of mad about that. And he said, you know what you remind me of, Art Tatum. He said, all the blacks beat their feet. And uh, I said, he said, did you ever hear of Art Tatum? And I said, no, I haven't. And he said, he has wonderful technique, wonderful. But he always had a but. He likes jazz. <laughs> Art thrived on jazz, and Toledo, during Prohibition, was a fertile place for jazz players. Despite an occasional raid, the clubs did well. From the respectable speakeasies like the Green Mill and Chateau de France, to the after-hours bootleg joints downtown, Chicken Charlie's, Waiters and Bellman's. It used to be uh, just one bootleg joint after another up and down uh, Illinois Street. And, uh, it, Tatum would go in and the crowd would just go mad. Odd is in the house, you know. Drinks would be flying, you know. Get him a pitcher of beer. They all waiting for Tatum because he worked at the Chateau of France. And after he closed up over there, then he'd show up there every night. And when he walked in, they called him, basically called him the boss. So when he walked in and he started to play, nobody would follow him. Like Rusty's Jazz Cafe today, the after-hours clubs of Prohibition were a gathering place for musicians who wanted to play pure jazz. Tatum was drawn to the after-hours spots throughout his career. One of his favorites was Val's in the Alley, a Cleveland club. Hollywood gave us their version of an after-hours spot in The Fabulous Dorsey's, the only theatrical film Tatum appeared in. The real thing was not quite so slick. Bell's was a little cottage. There was a big coal stove, a pot belly stove that sat in one corner. There was one, one door in and out, the front door. And you'd sit there, and every time anybody opened the door, the snow <laughs> and everything would be coming in. And so you're sitting in these circumstances, and it seemed that nobody uh, inhaled. I mean, uh, the room was just filled with smoke and the smell of that coal burning and everything. You had to like, I mean, this, this was an intriguing place. I mean, it was, uh, it wasn't, you know, all chrome and that sort of thing. And every time that door opened, well, the, the snow and in would come some musician with a music case, you know? And I've been in there on Saturday nights when you'd look up there and here's Tatum and there may be seven guys up there and they're all playing, you know? In the meantime, there's other people coming in and they're unpacking their instruments. And it was nothing by 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning that that corner of the room where the piano was and where all these musicians were, there'd be 15, 20 people standing up there waiting their turn or they had just gotten through or whatever it was. But this little room, you could just imagine, and these fellows, there were no amplifiers or anything like that. You played wide open. And when those 15 or 20 guys would cut loose, you've seen those Mickey Mouse cartoons where they're having a fight and the walls of the building just <laughs> pulsate and throb and expand. And that's just the way you could almost feel this little building. And your eardrums was like somebody walking around on your eardrums with golf shoes on or something. It was just, it, it, was, it almost hurt, believe me, it almost hurt. <laughs> Through his after-hours playing, Tatum became known to many named musicians passing through Toledo. But his late hours also led to a tragic encounter. My mom was asleep because I was asleep, you know. And uh, Mr. Adams, he started hooting and howling, oh, Mr. Tatum, Mr. Tatum, Mr. Tatum. And so finally my dad went to the window and asked him, he said, what's the matter? And he said, Art's out here laying here come out here right away. And so Mrs. Adams had put her robe on. She was outside, you know, with Art. And uh, my mother and dad run outside, and naturally I did too, you know, we went out there. And his eye was sort of hanging out where the guy had hit him, probably hit him with a blackjack. At least that's what they think was a blackjack. 
trying to rob him. But uh, he only got a little change off of him because uh, Art usually would hide his money. So he didn't get the money. You know, he just got a little change, maybe a couple dollars, something like that, that Art had in his pocket loose. So they brought him in the house and brought him in here in the front room. And uh, Mom says, oh, I'm going to call Dr. Leatherman. So she called Dr. Leatherman. And Dr. Leatherman says, I'll be over in a few minutes. So he came over. And he'd taken that eye or something out of the ball or something out in there and did something to it and put it back in there and banished it up. And so the next day, then Art went to him, you know. But uh, he never did see any more out that eye. So he didn't want to go under any more operations, eye operations. Unwilling to face more surgery, Tatum continued to concentrate on his plane as he waited for the right moment to move. WSPD featured him on a radio program that was eventually picked up by the NBC Blue Network. But his big moment came in 1932 when singer Adelaide Hall came to the Rivoli Theater. One of her pianists, Joe Turner, had been told to look up Tatum. He did. But the result of his piano duel with Tatum was not the kind he was likely to report to Adelaide. She was staying with Doc Stewart and his wife, Ella P., above the Stewart Pharmacy, and she was concerned about Frances Hill, her other pianist, who was ill. When Adelaide came in, the second night she was here, she had two pianists, and her husband was her manager, Bert, uh, and he uh, stayed there at the house. and. So that night they were, we were talking after the show, and he said, well, we just have to find somebody. Do you know anybody that can play a piano? And right away I thought about Art Tatum. An audition was set up at the All Saints Episcopal Church. Hill recovered in time to play the Rivoli job, but Adelaide was impressed with Tatum's playing, and a few months later she called the Stewarts to make arrangements to hire Tatum. Mr. Stewart, and I got together, of course, I was the person that always wanted something on paper. And they had Slater Gibson, who is attorney Slater Gibson, here in Toledo, to write up the contract. And we wrote up a contract for our Tatum to go with Adelaide Hall. Some people said that Tatum left too soon, but many people tried to convince him to leave sooner, including Duke Ellington. Duke used to come to Toledo in... Um, I knew Duke pretty well, also Sonny Greer. And they used to ask me uh, as about Art. Why didn't he leave and uh, come to New York? In fact, they talked with him. And then there were others, even Fats Waller. Now, he should have believed Fats Waller because Fats Waller took music from uh, James P. Johnson, who, uh, as I say, devised the stride method of uh, piano playing. Uh, but Tatum kept saying he wasn't ready. And I guess he wanted the assurance that uh, he would be acclaimed as the greatest when he arrived in New York. And this is what exactly happened. Don't ever sit down. He was quickly proclaimed the greatest, a fact that raises questions. What was different about Art Tatum? We both started with the same teacher. I beat my foot like Art Tatum. I liked Fats Waller, and I copied some of his music. Uh, apparently, he was an influence on Tatum, although he was far, far ahead of Waller when he finally finished. And, and then, of course, to the Lee Sims thing, and even to the, having the beer on the end of the piano. So there's five influences I had, and why didn't I go as far as art? I analyze a lot of players in this business. Many players function as a total unit. I uh, watched Artie Shaw, for instance, play years ago. Uh, Coleman Hawkins. Charlie Parker, Art Tatum. Mentally and physically, and whatever goes on with their nervous system, it's one total unit, you see? 
and it seems like their fingers go with their brain and their whole body automatically. He also had, uh, he was blessed with a hand that had a tremendous reach, a big hand. And I'm sure he had tremendous dexterity. And he certainly must have had a lot of love for what he was doing. A tremendous, he never hardly stopped playing. His mind moved so fast uh, while he was performing his music and stuff. Uh, you could hear things going on in, while he was playing. In a, a, and some of it would be, be going on so fast, you just wonder how he even thought that fast and was able to, to uh, take his ideas and put them through his hands and onto the piano. He had perfect pitch. He certainly had uh, a tremendous sense of rhythm. I don't know if beating his foot helped that or not. He would carry the rhythm. He'd carry the rhythm. Uh, Rhythm, reach, and perfect pitch aside, it was Tatum's left hand that helped make him unique. Able to play different songs with each hand simultaneously, Tatum took the basic left hand techniques, stride, walking bass, and comping chords, and was able to mix them with a speed that was unsettling to other musicians. I've talked to musicians and said, Jack, I know exactly what the guy's doing. He said, but the speed <laughs> that he does it in, you know, it makes you give up. With talent enough to make other piano players want to quit, Tatum did enjoy financial success and regular work, but his style was not always appreciated by the general public. Then I Tatum, you know, he listened, and then he sat down and played for me. And I remember my mother had to leave the room because he played just so much piano. And I went back in the kitchen, and I said, Mother, what's, what's wrong? And he said, man, that man just plays too much piano. Now, the thing about Art Tatum was he played so many notes that it was mind-boggling. And anything that's mind-boggling turns off most people. He plays too much piano for the average layman. And I think if the average layman would try anything on piano, then he would be able to understand how far advanced this man is. His playing to an average person was far out, was far out, but yet it was really far in. It was the, the most contained and valid music I can think of, you see. But you always face the same kind of a problem with the public. Years ago, I did, I, when I was struggling, I don't know how many years ago, but I played in Rock Island, Illinois, places like that, Moline. I played a club and I was, uh, I had a backup group that was fairly good, but not great, but uh, I was playing some jazz that I liked to play and dying with it. I mean, we emptied one house after another, you know. So in desperation on a Saturday night, it was kind of a noisy bunch people drinking, getting juiced, you know. I happened to see backstage, I had an old top hat. And, and just to pass the time and, and get through the job, I grabbed the top hat and came out with the top hat on. And I played like Ted Lewis. I don't know if you ever heard Ted Lewis, which was ridiculous, you know. It was a joke, except that the audience liked it. And the boss came to me and he said, he said, boy, I heard you were good, but I didn't know you was that good. <laughs> right? But that's a good example. I mean, it just hits you right in the, right in the head. It, it, it's a clear example of what a musician like Art Tatum had to contend with. Tatum had more than one problem to contend with. An unknown piano player once said, thank God he's black or none of our jobs would be safe. But Tatum wasn't one to accept the status quo. But anyhow, he said he wouldn't play the club unless his own people could, you know, come in to hear him. So the management said, OK. And he really drew the crowd in there, too. And I think, I don't think they stopped it after that, because they had a nice clientele. 
So, so that was one thing he broke into. In the end, it was probably his sheer musical genius that kept Tatum on the edge of the spotlight. He was, he was like Bird. They were both a genius. They had to do what they were doing, and they had to develop their way of playing. And there was no other way, no other course, but to go in the opposite direction of the public. It was nothing like rock and roll. A lot of them like we were the jazz, but art was just outstanding, and uh, and mostly the musicians was really impressed with him. Hey, are you guys going to take me to the jam session at Arcadium tonight, or aren't you? All right, I guess we're getting a little groggy. Let's go hear a real musician. Tatum's biggest fans were other musicians. As for the piano players, their admiration was matched by their intimidation. An incident at a club in New York was typical. So one night when I was there, Duke Ellington and his manager came in. And they sat down, and Tatum was already playing. So after Tatum got done with the set, the manager came over and announced over the PA system that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a guest in the house. And if for a little applause, we might get him to set in and play a number, you know. So naturally, give him the applause. Because everybody knew who Duke Ellington was. He was a big name. So after the announcement, the uh, applause subsided. He got up and he says that it says in his contract that wherever Tatum is playing, he does not play. So naturally, he didn't play. He thanked <laughs> their audience for the, for the recognition and all that. But he would not set in. And like I said, that holds true for nearly everybody that I know of. Before he came in, everybody would set in, you know. But when the boss walked in, when he played, that's where it stayed right there. And nobody followed Tatum. The first time that I really absolutely fell in love with somebody was, I once heard on the radio, by accident, I just turned on the jazz station, and I heard some guy playing a humoresque of Dvorak. And, uh, it was all jazzed up, and it was absolutely incredible playing, and I didn't know who it was. And then the announcer said that it was Art Tatum. And of course, that, that just totally slew me, because uh, I've never heard anybody with such incredible uh, facility in that particular idiom. Itzhak Perlman was not the only classical musician who admired Tatum, and in spite of his love of jazz, Tatum had a taste for the classics, too. So this little lady said, uh... You play so beautifully, he said, but um, heartily, very heartily. I was just wondering if you, you could manage to play any kind of Bach, anything from Bach. Do you know Bach? He said, oh, a little. So would you mind playing some for me? And he said, certainly. So uh, he sat down and started playing Bach. And an hour later, he was still playing Bach. And so then he stopped. <laughs> the lady said, she said, uh, I never will open my big mouth again. <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> Tatum respected many of the classical composers, especially Bach and Chopin. His recording of Mezzanet's Elegy, however, hints that he may have felt that some classical pieces were taken too seriously. In that recording, he quotes from Drigo's Serenade. The Stars and Stripes Forever. Then brings the tempo up to piano roll pace. In 1956, Tatum bought a white tie and tails, anticipating a formal recital tour. But illness plagued him that year. He gave up the beer glass at the end of the piano. But he also recorded a series of albums. Buddy DeFranco remembers his sessions with Tatum well. He's playing along, and, and, and sometimes I'd be playing and watch his fingers. I'd be fasc always fascinated the way to try to figure out how he played all those runs put his thumb underneath his hand. Mm -hmm. It was completely unorthodox, but it would come out. 
it would really come out beautifully. So uh, I don't know if you knew Art's humor at all, but he he then middle of his solo put one hand on his knee and then played, and he looked he looked around laughing, you know, at me. How about this, you know? And he played a couple of choruses with one hand. See, great trick. You know, I forgot to come in because. I was looking at him, you know, and he thought that was hilarious. See? Since I was maybe five or six, I heard our Tatum records. But still, there's nothing like the experience of working with somebody like that to know, then to find, you know, that energy. And I've often wanted a, another couple shots at it, you know. Nine months after the DeFranco sessions, Tatum died in Los Angeles. The funeral book read like a who's who in jazz. In his short career, he had redesigned jazz piano, and his success left a double challenge for young Toledo players. Tatum proved that a local musician could rise to the top, but does lightning strike twice? Perhaps all piano players feel like Count Basie when he agreed to let a young blind man sit in. He stood close to the piano, so that he could jump in and save him if he had to. Years later, Basie said, I'm still standing there. Production and presentation of this program was made possible in part by a grant from the Ohio Arts Council.